So we're yeah. recording the Cogni Birth today, um, which is all about kind of the neurodiversity within technology space. Um, and I'm speaking to Abigail today. So um, Abigail, if you could just introduce yourself a little bit more about what you're doing right now um, and why this is an interesting topic for you personally. Sure. So um, I've worked in kind of the HR talent space for around 15 or 20 years. Um, diversity and inclusion has always been really important to me. And that's not just around people with um, DNI characteristics, but around everyone feeling included and how we make our workplaces inclusive. Um, I'm neurodiverse, so I have autism, ADHD and dyslexic. Um, so you don't get much more neurodiverse than me. And I think going through my struggles throughout my career and my journey made it really important to me within my role to be able to make a difference. About 10 years, I started campaigning um, for lots of things within neurodiversity and working with uh, different companies to support them on how do we support neurodiverse people in the workplace um, and also how do we help them succeed and how do we ensure our hiring processes are diverse as well. Um, also looking at some pieces around performance management which seems to be the biggest struggle because often neurodiverse people are performance managed on things that are characteristic of being neurodiverse. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah that's a bit about me and what I do and um, why I'm so passionate about this subject yeah absolutely and that that makes sense I think um when it affects you you can really throw your heart and soul into it because you have that sort of personal experience with where yeah. things just haven't worked for you and where you have at times felt really isolated and and you can have that personal relationship to that um and obviously you're doing a lot well your work in the talent acquisition space um what do you think is the best things that can be implemented um, to support neurodivergent employees? If we're looking at the tech space yeah. and like what yeah. it looks like now, yeah. is there anything that either you've done already or you think more tech companies could do just to make it more inclusive? Because I think that's a huge issue for a lot of people yeah. at the moment. Yeah. And I think, you know, this is going to be quite controversial, but I do like to be controversial. I think massive <laughs> marketing campaigns, look at us, we're so diverse. And a lot of what we need to do, you know, there's a lot of businesses making money from it now as well, offering lots of services. The, the key point is help people in your business to value value difference understand difference and learn how to communicate with difference that's the number one you could bring a million neurodiverse people to the table if we don't know how to do that it won't work mm -hmm. number two is ensuring you know I said a bit earlier we cannot be what we cannot see you know one of the reasons why I've hired a lot of neurodiverse people it's all over my profile so if I headhunt someone or interview someone they're like wow she's neurodiverse she's been there a year or whatever it's obviously yeah. a safe space and that, that's what people you can do all the marketing in the world people need to see that there is diversity and it's a safe place for them there so that that is you know making sure your recruitment team is diverse in every way so that people can see that because they're the people reaching out, making sure your interview panel is diverse. And the, the third thing I would say is definitely important is stop templating your interview process. Your interview process, I can guarantee you, is aimed at neurotypical people and most neurodiverse people yeah. won't pass that. For a neurodiverse person, tell them what you need to see. Let them display that in whichever way. We need to see how you strategically think out blah, blah, blah. We need to know how you'd look at this problem and then let them show you in their own way. They may be great communicators. They may be better on paper. They may be better on slides. But, you know, stop templating, stop templating people and telling them exactly how they need to show their skills, because that's not inclusive. And that, I don't think that's just for neurodiverse people. I think we should stop doing that with people full stop. You know, like when they send you a template or they say, do it like this. Why? Let people sh what they need to show you is that they have the skills and they yeah. match your values. So let them show that through whichever way they need to. Yeah, totally. And I think that is from my personal experience with working with. So obviously I'm working on the other side of recruitment, working yeah. within an agency. And yeah. so a lot of the time we'll get like the job spec and we'll talk through the interview process and it will be at one, two, three, this is the interview process and it doesn't change for anyone. Yeah. And I think that's exactly what you're speaking to. I think sometimes there is this thing of, well, 
you can't just change it so it that so that it's easier quite yeah. quite for someone who is neurodiverse yeah. and we have to like a neurotypical person has to do it this way it's like actually what you're saying there is it doesn't yeah, have for anyone like that's inclusion inclusion is about everyone being able to bring their true selves to work or to the recruitment process by yeah. trying to put people in a box and telling them how they should behave and be to get the job is not inclusivity um yeah. in my view and I think that's a lot of things that I see a lot of businesses they kind of section us off so they do something mm. different for or they put us in a different uh they put us in a different area or a different thing we, we we just need adjustment so if you imagine there's a tree and we're all all of us are, have got a ladder but some of our ladders are a bit higher than other ladders we just need equal ladders that's all we're asking for so and that's about yeah. making minor adjustments and not feeling you know sectioned off or slightly different just you know just making it more more equal uh for all I think totally totally and it's that equity part isn't it where that's the part of the, like I, I think I've seen like a visual of that of people yeah. on, like looking over a fence I think that's yeah. probably a yeah. really common so picture people there's, have there's seen. one person who's kind of helping someone up or giving them a bucket and yeah. what we're saying is we don't want you to help us cross the road or give us a bucket for your apples we just want we just want to be given the adjustments so that yeah. we can on our own you know because if you imagine for a neurodiverse person we spent our whole life feeling different do we want to feel different or secluded when we get into work or separated or sectioned off no and that is the same for the recruitment process um I always think doing an opportunity for a callback on your website so when you apply do you have any needs do you need a callback having a diversity um a neurodiversity expert on your team and maybe having their name say this is Abigail she's our neurodiversity champion she's neurodiverse she can give you a call and really asking them because you know I spoke to you know when I speak to people in the field that assess neurodiverse people they'll say I've never seen two the same in 20 years occupational therapists but we also have this thing of like oh we've got loads of dyslexics like you just need me to write this for you and then ask them what they need if you saw a blind person crossing the road right you wouldn't grab hold of their arm and help them across the road you'd say to them would you would you like some help and maybe they'd say yes maybe they'd say no it's the same with neurodiverse ask them yeah. what help they need um you know there's often situations where people want to write things for you why are you writing it for me I can write <laughs> and yeah, I yeah. just need a bit extra time and you know so I think that's really key as well yeah no that's a really good um analogy there as well and we we but I actually will say I didn't record the start of our conversation that's totally, totally oh. my, my bad but okay. <laughs> but what we were talking about for reference before was a lot of the misconceptions and I think that's a really really big point around what neurodiversity means and like you just said yeah. there's no like with experts talking about it they've not seen two people of the same ever yeah. yeah so that with that in mind I think we want to box people into okay ADHD this is what you are. Yeah, this dyslexic. is what you display. This is yeah, what you need. And totally. I was talking earlier about not being autistic enough. So often I'm not autistic enough to be mm. called, you know, because there's, as I was saying, in the uh, media, you know, in the on TV, when you see an autistic person, it's just one way and everyone's mm. like that. And you were saying, you know, the views that you'd had from seeing on media, you know, I'm an autistic person that dates I've got friends I've got I've got work I've got you know and everyone is different so we need to display that because often you know people say well you're not autistic clearly why what does an autistic person look like what do they yeah and you know and I don't display all the traits that an autistic but it doesn't mean that I'm not so I think you know I was talking very much about the media and the importance of how they break down misconceptions you know when I, I grew up in a small town there was no one like me so I thought I was the only one imagine how many yeah 20 percent of the population I thought I was the only one until I yeah, moved to London and yeah. also I didn't nobody ever told me anything good they you know I remember them telling my parents I was in the room I'm really sorry to tell you you know as though it was just you know I, there's no I don't have a disorder I don't suffer with I'm not disabled I'm just neurodiverse and I'm living in a neurotypical world I've just got a difference mm. in the brain and as you get older and you learn all these superpowers like wow I'm amazing with this you know we talked about the high empathy the high justice good leaders out of box thinking hyper focus uh data good with data and trends and innovation yeah. and seeing 
successful people and this is why I think we need mentors in the workplace and in the school system who are neurodiverse so people you cannot be what you cannot see people need to see you know it wasn't until I was like in my mid-20s that I saw these hundreds and thousands you know self-made millionaires actresses all these people yeah. and I was like wow like if, if if I'd have known that as a child what a difference that would have made to my own self-beliefs and perceptions of my yeah. neurodiversity yeah yeah that's interesting and I wonder whether a lot like because I when I was growing up I was I was saying to you earlier I can't remember anyone I knew being autistic or having any sort of neurodiverse you know neurodiversity and it, and it's interesting because I wonder whether it was almost because of the bias and the negative bias that was associated previously that people weren't willing to come forward and be that sort of role model and or they weren't diagnosed or they didn't True, yeah. or they had that view that you know oh well if I was autistic if I was dyslexic I should be like this you know and it, it's that whole thing of like as I said occupational therapists tell you have never seen two the same so yeah often and this is what I was saying earlier um around how many neurodiverse people undiagnosed are in the mental health system because they don't know why um you know it, they they have certain obstacles and and often um you know misdiagnosed um and not given the support they need and you know another key point i made is we don't have enough medical studies on how particular drugs and particular treatments affect neurodiverse brains um there's they're starting to do a study now because they believe some kind of um some drugs have a different effect um so you'll probably hear about people with ADHD what coffee does to a lot not all of us I mustn't say all but what coffee does to us so coffee actually relaxes us <laughs> it sounds very it's very yeah I know it's very odd so uh if we were to drink a red bull or coffee and often we can consume really large amounts of this and it doesn't so you know it has a different effects on us so that you know the whole thing about you know being at work and, and working but maybe not having uh the support we need is a lot to do with kind of diagnosis and I kind of went off on a loophole there uh very ADHD of me but um, no no yeah. I don't I actually so relate to that because I've recently had a conversation with a colleague um because I have been taking steps to learn more about neurodiversity and um, uh, make sure that I am basically doing as much as I possibly can in the position that I'm in to make a bit more impact and share insights, essentially. Um, so with that in mind, I, I'm a very anxious person and I look at the monsters and the co I can't drink coffee at all because yeah. I will... I don't even know I just don't put myself in that position <laughs> it's not for you it's not, it's not, it's for, not you. for me <laughs> but I see someone at work who has has that, those types of real energy drinks and I was like oh my gosh how do you and then I went up and just had the conversation I was like wow you how do you do that this time and they it actually explained for that person it was really relaxing and I was thinking that is so interesting but more to that instead of holding back and not wanting to have a conversation or not approach that topic I just went over and you know just was inquisitive and wanted to learn and wanted to yeah. find out more and and that's what I did want to talk to you a little bit about is I think sometimes there's that fear that I don't want to say something that's going to offend and of course yeah. we should always have that in mind no yeah. you know if hopefully no one's going into a conversation trying to offend people yeah. but communication styles at work with kind of that in mind what would you say is a good good way to approach these sorts of topics with a neurodiverse individual yeah so without you, being exclusive but being inclusive if that makes yeah. sense so you hit the nail on the head with an individual don't go in any preconceptions as to they've got ADHD, they've got dyslexia. I mean, I started a job once and one woman was like, don't worry, we had one of you. I was like, one of me? Yeah, the last girl, she was dyslexic. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, thanks. I've just been put in a, in a box. Yeah, so I yeah. think also appreciate that people are on different places in their journey. You know, I'm a lot older and I'm in a very, you know, obviously I talk, I do campaigns. Um, so I'm very open. 
somebody else, you know, they might be the same age as me. They might be uh, quite far along in their career. They might not be open about having those conversations. They might not feel relaxed. So first of all, judging where people are and asking them, is this something you're comfortable to talk about? And when you are ready, I'm there. I think the key things that kind of already start a conversation off badly is being told you've got a mental health disorder. Absolutely nothing wrong with having a mental health disorder. However, we don't. We're neurodiverse. We have a slight difference in our brains. Using the word disorder, it's not a disorder. <laughs> you know, it's in the word disorder, as in not ordered, as in not well, not good. Um, suffer from. Um, that's another word. So just being really careful with your language, judging where someone is um, in their journey, um, treating them as an individual. Um, I always think these conversations show your own vulnerability. So, you know, you just said to me just now when we're having this conversation, I've been very open and you said to me, I sometimes get anxious. Right. And I'm not saying that you have to go up to everyone who works for you and say you get anxious. But no, I think they probably know that. I, though. <laughs> I think, oh, but, letting, you know, showing some vulnerability about, mm. you know, uh, an authenticity that's what I said we spoke before that we weren't going to rehearse this conversation and we weren't going to have set questions because we want it to be authentic and neurodiverse people and and people who are not neurodiverse who are in the workplace to listen and hear our natural authenticity that's number one if you go in rehearsed formally you you won't make a connection with people yeah um so I think and you know leading on from that as well performance management we were talking about promotion so you know, a neurodiverse person is 40% less likely to get promoted. Is that because they're not as good in their role? Absolutely not. It's because we have a stereotype of what senior leadership looks like. Senior leadership yeah. doesn't interrupt. Person with ADHD does. Senior leadership is very considered. They take breaks. Um, they make sure their conversations lead. You know, an ADHD person is going to be like that, but it doesn't mean yeah. they're not. Um, you know, someone with dyslexia will not be able to do presentations or emails to the same level. So these people who have, you know, uh, autism, by the way, has the highest um, scoring for IQs. So it's nothing yeah. to do with IQ. Um, and these people don't progress because, again, same as your interview process, you've got a stereotype for what a neurotypical person looks like in a senior role. And if you don't meet that, then you know, you, you're not going to succeed. And the other point, sorry, I just wanted to quickly make is how many neurodiverse no, people in their performance reviews are picked up on things which are to do with their neurodiversity, their organisation, their time management, um, how, you know, how they formulate, yeah. how they communicate. And I hear it time and time again. And I think, you know, it doesn't take long to check uh, online if this could be something that comes from being neurodiverse occupational therapist um so you've got um they actually offer a service which is um back to work which supports people in neurodiverse getting back to work you for absolutely free you can speak to an occupational therapist and they will tell you what is it you know and i think you know neurodiverse people the problem is not only do we have heightened emotional senses so our our bodies on red alert criticism you know we have something called rejection sensitivity which means that we act really badly to criticism or rejection not only do they have a low you know a low belief system because of schooling being brought up feeling like they're different they don't fit in they then go into the workplace and yet again they're told yeah. they're not good enough and they're not right and they're not you know normal so that's a massive piece but that for me you know we talk about recruitment great let's teach people to value difference let's change our recruitment processes what's the point if people come in and they're not going to flourish you know mm. so I think sometimes we look at that bit oh if we can just get diverse you know all areas of diversity in but how how are we nurturing how are we ensuring yeah. equality once they're here yeah totally it's all about the onboarding if you really look at a lot of the work that's been done it's not really about the you know maintaining and you know that sort of side of it once you're in the job what that actually is going to look like for you and yeah. I know that this is you know you've progressed in your career you from what I can see you've done amazingly well Thank um you. but you but you also are a neurodiverse individual so what can companies do because it is tough totally agree with what you say because it's organization tick you know are you are you able to do this? Are you able to do this? Whatever it is, it's based, promotions are based on neurotypical people. Yeah, yeah. And so what can we do then so 
so that it's not i know it's you know nothing's yeah, gonna I, change I, overnight yeah but... just just not having a set way that someone has to be to be successful tell them what i need from you i so in you know in what i do i need you to be excellent with people i need you to understand business problems and business objectives and reflect that for your recruitment i need you to make processes i need you to be fantastic with people i need you to attract people and then let let that person go and do that however um is good for them so work on output not not the ways of doing things or how your yeah. business works you know set them goals that are an output and the same with the recruitment process we need to see this this and this you do it however you want you don't need yeah. to use my my set 90 day plan or my i'm going to give you a problem the best way and this is not just about you no know, diverse people this is everyone mm. why do we have these set boxes give people a problem Here's, so we're going to interview you. We're going to first of all check your people skills. Are you, you know, are you a good influencer? Do you have low ego? Are you collaborative? Are you in a, in, do you, you know, are you great innovation? Once we've done that and we've established those core skills, then, you know, can they do the business problem? If we talk about tech, right? So obviously in tech, we need to check there. They can code. Um, nobody's doing coding tests anymore. Where a lot of people aren't, thank goodness. Some businesses are. Give them a technical problem. Build this. Here's the problem. And, and neurodiverse people love this because they find um, they like things literally. So li literally, this is what's happening. Go and do it mm. rather than. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you code? You know, so you give them. So you give them, a, you know, you compare program while you're on. So this has happened. How would you fix this piece of code? OK, this is the problem. Who would you inform? Who would you collaborate with? How would you fix the problem? How would you monitor the success of your solution? Those four questions right. in any area of tech. And anyone can do that rather yeah. than do a tech test, do a seven page presentation. Um, and often we find it difficult to know what neurotypical people want. So often when we're given things, it's like, can you do this? And then, um, you know, my boss often say that's fantastic. Not quite what we wanted, but fantastic because our brains just work differently. We, we yeah. see things differently, um, yeah. you know. But um, yeah, I think stay away from templates. And I think that will not just make your business successful for neurodiverse or people with DNI characteristics. You'll get people who are different, who think different, who act different, who don't th fit into this kind of box that you've made of what good looks like. And guess what you'll get then? Different ideas, different experiences, and you'll get innovation. Your product will move on. Um, and your customers, you right? Your customer is not all one person. They're neurodiverse. They've got DNI yeah. characteristics. So make the people supporting that solution, you know, um, inclusive and diverse, and and that will ultimately, I think, make the business more successful. Sorry, I went off on a tangent there, but <laughs> no, I, I love it. I think that's so helpful. Just like that's a really clear and easy thing that everyone can actually do. And it, I think when you give people a little bit more of an open field, whoever you are, you will probably think of something that someone hasn't thought of before. And actually, that's the best thing for a business. Like when I hire into my team, for example, I always say, you know, I want people who are nothing like me because there's, exactly. I don't want to like... A, that I would drive myself mad if I had someone like me, first of all. But I want to learn different things from every single member yeah. of my team. And, and that's worked really well for us so far. Um, but there is that thing of hiring the same sort of minds and yeah, someone who's similar it, to safe. you. It's non-risk. And the other thing I really just wanted to briefly talk about is how we talk about what a good... So if you want to get promoted, so say you're in a recruitment agency, I worked in recruitment agencies, you need to do this many deals, you need to be this, this and this. Why don't we just look at our teams and go, who's good at what? Who's yeah. good at what? Let's, you know, why doesn't... Same a neurodiverse or a neurotypical, but why do they have to be good at everything? You know, so yeah. for instance, people with ADHD, we get hyper-focused. We're very productive. We have a high level of just justice. We're high energy. We're fantastic problem solvers because every day we just have to live <laughs> with this. Yeah. And in, but, you know, people with autism, like, you know, might not be fantastic at, you know, all of the social bits, but are going to be fantastic at problem solving, identifying trends, innovation. So yeah. it's moving away from that mindset of to be good at what Work, you've got to have this this and this no here's my team out of my team we are good at and I think 
valuing that it's okay not to be good at everything and really valuing like this person's great at this and, and picking them up for that you're amazing at this this is what you do in my team um rather than you know I think people spend so many hours trying to get better at that one thing that you know whether they're neurodiverse and it that that's the reason they find that difficult or they're neurotypical. Mm. And what we should be going is, but this is what you're great at, right? Let's make that shine. Let's excel yeah. in that, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think especially, I think that's when you do see tech and recruitment crossover. And I've seen that a lot in my career when I speak to my clients of, you know, for example, gender ratios are not great in recruitment. It, particularly in agent agency recruitment it's very yeah. male dominated we see that in technology as well um and then just kind of transferring that over is you know we want when you're in sort of a talent hr recruitment type role you're trying to cover every base and you're trying to i'm not very good at that so i'm going to keep keep doing it and spending hours hours doing that it's similar then when you look at a job spec and it's like i want you to do i want you to do front end back end i want you to machine learning i want you to have some devops principles and it's that same sort of mindset to a degree where it's like but you're not going to find someone like that. Yeah. And why don't you get someone who's really awesome at, you know, problem solving within machine learning ops, you know, yeah. and, and yeah. that person will be incredible and they'll bring other things to the table. And and, and because you're focusing on that, they'll just shine even brighter, I mean, you know? Well, yeah, what I've learned in kind of 15 years of hiring tech is if they are good at one area of tech, right, they're excellent at that one area of tech, but they have all the soft skills, they've got a low ego, they're curious, they're great with people. Those people will learn any skill that you need them to do, um, as opposed to, you know, often in businesses, we hire that person that's got everything. Um, right. And often, they've got everything technically, but not on all not all times, but uh, often they don't have the soft skills. So mm. what is the point of being the best in machine learning, RPA? You know, you've got like every every technical skill, but they can't interact with the people they're, you know, maybe they're growing a product with. And we see that a lot in tech, you know. I mean, obviously in tech, we've got roles like architects and, you know, principal roles in all areas of tech, which are more technically focused. But when it's when you're in tech and you're you're not purely technical, also valuing those softer skills, um, yeah. I think as well is really. I mean, you talked about the gender, you know, the the gender kind of gap in. Well, in tech, we've got a ma in software development, for instance, the last figure, I think it's gone up to 16 percent. But we say well, we're just going to keep trying to find women developers and, you know, we're not going to treat them the same and we're just going to hire. But what we don't say is, OK, we've got a pretty good tech team. Let's hire people who've done different degrees, not computer science, philosophy, economics. Let's teach them how to code. Let's let's go out and find females who are, you know, brilliant and smart and and, and you know, bring them into tech. But how we solve the problem is we go, we're just going to keep trying to find, you know, even if there's they're not there you know yeah oh yeah definitely huge <laughs> huge thing um and then I I wanted to talk a bit about the role models piece because I know yeah. that you said when you were growing up and what you spoke about it within the media you didn't really see anyone until you I don't know if I'm getting this right but your 20s sort of time yeah I didn't know I a long didn't time. meet anyone like me and I remember it being quite a great moment because it was actually someone that I'd made friends with. And I was like, not only have I made friends with this person, there's never me. Yeah, I, I didn't know. I, I felt very isolated. I spent probably, I would even say like 25 years of my life trying to convince people that I was not neurodiverse. I wouldn't tell friends. I wouldn't tell boyfriends. I wouldn't tell workplaces. And like the horrendous like stress of trying to be neurotypical all day you know for instance you know my foot not tapping or not interrupting or not having energy bursts or you know I even make like I speak out loud or I make sudden noises I, yeah. I sound like a lot of fun I know um you know having to hold that down for 25 years not yeah. just at work but in my personal life like you know wow that's a lot and then I sort of you know when I came to London and you know the turning point for me was when diversity and inclusion um about 10 years ago became a massive thing and then suddenly I was pushed to the frontier and I was like oh my god I can actually make a difference I can actually make a difference in what I do in all areas of inclusion because 
we talk about people with uh, DNI characteristics, they should match, you know, what they're hiring. Anyone who hasn't feel, felt included, anyone who's felt different, anyone who's mm. felt like they don't fit in are excellent people to champion diversity and inclusion because we felt it and we we don't want others to feel that, you know. Um, but, yeah, the role models are, you know, I, I printed, I, I went to give um, a talk to um, some neurodiverse children and I just printed off about a hundred of the top uh, 200 neurodiverse role models everyone from Albert Einstein actresses I mean most of Hollywood like and the mm. children not just the neurodiverse children but the neurotypical children were like what like, uh, yeah well you can actually achieve things yeah you can and you know we need to change the conversation from a disability to yeah. difference we're just different that's yeah. it We've got a difference in our brain. We don't suffer from, it's not a disorder. We don't have a mental health issue. We just have a difference in our brain. And we're living in a world created by people who are neurotypical, which is why it can be challenging. Um, yeah. That's kind of how I view it now, not before. But yeah. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's kind of, you know, you've had that experience. It's not probably an experience that you'd want people necessarily to go through at a young no. age and have to no. hide such a well just yourself really if we're yeah. talking really brutally honestly you yeah. don't want someone to have to go through that yeah so it's all about what can we do now for kind of people coming through the ranks and even you know children really really at that age what can we do to make it more inclusive and and yeah like you said it's not a disability but we still have that mindset I think yeah and, yeah and, it's just changing the narrative really I think on and that for me it's so simple and you know it's so simple and it doesn't cost loads of money and yeah. it's not a big marketing campaign it's not a head of neurodiversity it's really simple whether it be school or work okay teach people how to interact with difference teach people to value difference make sure that people who are teaching communicating recruiting value understand and have high emotional intelligence number one number yeah. two stop templating you know when i was at school uh, my parents had to fight for me to sit my gccs they said she's top set for everything she can't get it on the page though if she was just doing it orally she'd be an a-star student why couldn't i do it orally why did i have to write it down I, yeah still to this day i'm like huh um yeah, why yeah. are we telling you know everything why can't we you know let children learn in a way that they want to learn um why is it you know we're still using victorian bells in school lesson times from victorian times why haven't we evolved <laughs> why haven't yeah, we evolved you know and that's why a large number of children are now being homeschooled um so whether it's school recruitment work stop having a template that is it let people bring their true selves to work let them be creative i mean there's always things you know if we talk about things like gdpr or legislation there's always things we have to do by a template but god there's a lot of stuff we don't why yeah, yeah. so why don't we just you know why don't we just say to our team this is what i want from you you know say you worked in a recruitment agency and you'd say i would like this many hires I would like you to think about how we can connect with clients and offer them a good service. Don't tell them how or how many calls or how many hours. Ask them to go and do that and then yeah. come back and tell you how. That person will not only perform well, but they will feel engaged because they're part of the solution. Who wants to be told, here's a job for you, but I'm going to tell you how to do it? Yeah. yeah. That's not enjoyable yeah, yeah. for anyone. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> I think I that's think really that's true. true. Um, um, and in and terms, terms of, of, I guess, any training or tools that people can use, have you got any that you're like, okay, I would recommend looking into this or as a company who wants to yeah to promote neurodiversity i've got i've got a list it's also on my linkedin so on my linkedin there are articles on supporting neurodiverse people tools so if you just bear with me one second i'll get my list of tools so obviously yeah, you've yeah. got chat gbt um which which can help us kind of put things together uh read aloud free on chrome so not only can i speak into it and it can write for me but it can read 
uh, crystal and other tools which tell you tone. So on my signature, you've probably seen this, Anna, it says, I'm dyslexic, big ideas, small typos. And it also says, as an autistic ADHD dyslexic person, I can't write in tone. So apologies if my message sounds direct. And then it also says underneath, if you don't understand anything, let me know. Um, so there's BookBeat and all of those. So basically they will summarize documents or books for you or things that you need to learn or study. Um, and they will summarize the information from that. So Sorry, I'm just going to get my full list, but most of no, these are free and access to work give three thousand pounds for anyone neurodiverse in the workplace. And a lot of places don't know that they do free assessments. Um, yeah. And a lot of people don't don't actually realize that that's a service. But yeah, there's a, there's a full list. Um, I've actually got a full list on my link. Sorry, I'm just trying to find it now um, of all the tools. But all of these tools are not expensive um and and super easy let me just see which ones i've got listed did i go through them all uh grammarly crystal for tone uh blinkist or bookbeat for summarizing information chat gbt chrome read aloud yeah that's just some of them but yeah that's awesome i i am a big big advocate of grammarly that saved me a lot of a lot do you of want to hear something really embarrassing so oh, my right. spelling and punctuation is so bad. So I obviously make loads of documents, slide decks, things like that. Sure, yeah. I, got an e I got an email from Grammarly to say I was in the top uh, three users globally. <laughs> wow. How my spelling is. I'd oh obviously get a lot of documents, but there'd been so many corrections that they were logging it every time. So I was the, in the top three users globally. Oh, my gosh. I feel like you should get a prize for that. Bit, the top yeah. user <laughs> well yeah it, it was quite funny I was like wow how much have I written this week but again I couldn't that is something that is so useful for me and Grammarly totally. learns it learns um my my spelling mistakes it learns my tone because it's say there and there there are some things that it can't always pick up on um you know there's a lot of words that it doesn't know the difference but the, the Grammarly now is really evolved to understand what you're talking about which really helps yeah I love it I can't I'm every time I I have someone joining the team I'm like download yeah, it Grammarly. even if yeah I'm like even if you're like feel pretty confident I bet you it will just one thing it will pick at and you'll be like thank goodness <laughs> um, but also a lot of people tell me neurotypical people tell me it's taught them like true punctuation so they learn punctuation at school and then they got Grammarly and like what you can put a yeah. comma after that what yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually yeah. it's good for everyone I think I love it it's perfect <laughs> um and then I guess is there anything else that that you that you were keen to speak about um I know that we spoke a lot about sort of the education and like promotions and stuff but I think one thing I did want to talk to you about and then I will i We'll let you go because I know it's Friday. No, it's been great. I really, really enjoyed our chat because it's been very natural. You know, it's nice. Yeah. It's been good. Yeah. I think what I, I was speaking to my boss about this the other day, and it was thought leaders or people who do things right at the start of a trend, you know, they're willing to take the risk and yeah. they're willing to say, let me just try this and see if it works. And then you have the people in between who are kind of measuring to see if it works. Yeah. And deciding if if it starts to get a bit of success, I might try it too. And then there are people on the other side who say, until I see the success, I won't do it. And I yeah. will, will physically not do yeah. it until yeah. that happens. Yeah. And I just think maybe it's that thing with with it with neurodiversity and measuring success in a different way that doesn't feel as routine yeah. um, to organizations. Um like measuring that success that comes through from giving a bit more openness and giving a bit more autonomy or whatever that yeah. is yeah how I know we've spoken about it a bit but what are your success st stories maybe personally or within the, your organization where you've been able to measure that success um in a different way and how has that appeared to you yeah, well, I, I don't think it needs to be in a different way. I just think the the how needs to be in a different way. The yeah, how. Okay, yeah, so yeah, yeah. What's key to me is make really clear the outcomes, because often we have a very different way of thinking and we don't know your outcome. And I think in every job role, people should be better at that. This is what we need from you. This is the outcome. How do you want to get there? How do you yeah. want to map that out? Um. I'm very lucky that I most of the businesses I've worked for have gone through high growth startups or consulting. So they want me to do everything 
new yeah. and different. Yeah. So that's where I really kind of found, you know, my home is finding businesses that are growing or starting up. How do we do creating? What does our org look like? How's our ways of working? What's our culture? What's our values? What's our strategy? So that's worked really well for me. I, I guess in a really big organisation, I have worked for kind of Fortune 500s, but it was kind of newer areas that I worked in where it was all, you know, mm. we've done this, uh, you know, we've done this since 1990, whatever. Um, I think always trial things, right? you know you you always get an element of risk so trial things because also that will help you get trial and error we need trial and error to know how we tailor no business is going to be the same so trial it on a small group um i read something really interesting about successful businesses um they said a small part was about luck um some of it was about the people and the thought leadership within that the biggest uh kind of indicator for highly successful businesses that they took very big risks without without necessarily knowing being able to measure how bad how big that risk was um and there were some examples which is really interesting and if you look at businesses we all know businesses right who are very successful and look at what they do you know they're always the leaders they're always doing it first um but yeah I would say and I would say you know the measures of success you know, our retention. Why don't we measure retention of our neurodiverse community? Yeah, you all DNI characteristics. Oh, we've hired thirty women in tech. Oh, how long did they stay? Mm-hmm. Uh, how how engaged were they in their engagement surveys? Yeah. How part of this company did they? How included did they feel? How did you measure that? So, you know, I think we need to stop going. You know. Oh, we hired six of you know neurodiverse people, or and start looking at retention. And yeah, and so and true. and also succession. As I said, as a neurodiverse person, you're because of your behavioural characteristics, you're forty percent less likely to get promoted at work. Let's look at that for a measure. How many neurodiverse people get promoted in a in our organisation as opposed to people at the same level who are neurotypical? So just start looking at it differently. Yeah. Um, I think I don't know if that answered your question. No, it it definitely <laughs> does. It definitely does. Um, I definitely feel like I could speak to you about this forever because there is, there is like, cause, because there was, I believe there is so much work to be done. You could just, there's there's almost overwhelming. Um, yeah. Like what, how can, what's the next step and all of that sort of stuff. But I, I did promise that was my last question. <laughs> um, I, I think as well, it's just so much, it, it's now so great that this is now what companies do want to do, you know, and I, yeah, I'll be really true. honest, when I was in my 20s, people just considered that I wouldn't work in an office. And, you know, and well, you, you know, we always say, well, someone's got to be fit for the role. That's part of it if they can't, you know, and it's like, you know, reasonable adjustments. So at the moment, as part of the Equality Act, businesses must uh, give us reasonable adjustments. Right. But did you know there is no governing body of whether that adjustment is reasonable or not? So you as a business could say that adjustment, Abigail, not reasonable and you could not hire me on that. So, there's yeah, there's so much work to be done. What is a reasonable adjustment and why are we tem- forget whether you're neurodiverse? Why are we templating how people work, what they do, how 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 they act how they communicate you know because that's that's what we think is good you know valuing difference again um that's the key message i think yeah definitely valuing difference for sure and for anyone that did want to reach out to you or i know that obviously you do a lot of talking within this area and you do some consulting if I'm if I'm not wrong in thinking yeah that, yeah how would be best to yeah just reach out, reach to, out to me on LinkedIn and um, the consulting that I do for businesses I, I don't charge for it I do it in my free time and that's just around any businesses that would like to ask me some questions as a neurodiverse person someone who works in the talent space as to how to be more inclusive within their business um how to you know around the performance management piece or even recruitment um but yeah you can go to my LinkedIn and reach out out. um I'm also on TikTok I love a bit of content creation so you can yeah you can also Nero Spicy on TikTok as well which is a, a kind of comical look at neurodiversity while also trying to um send out a positive message as well but I think most of my talks that I do and campaign that I do is around and I we haven't had a massive amount of time today but really focusing on all those yeah. superpowers all of those great you know we say we struggle with this this and this but we forget to say there's also loads of things we can do which are pretty pretty 
pretty cool um yeah. and and i think we forget we forget that and um sometimes neurodiverse people forget that like yeah that's an obstacle but you're brilliant at that you know yeah 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 it definitely is like thinking of it as a superpower i think that yeah. can't be that can't be forgotten because obviously we will speak about where there are difficulties and challenges but we don't want to completely focus on what what isn't working for people we also want to say you know there's so much opportunity you know the neurodiverse people are the people who are thought leaders who innovate who bring these ideas that won't be thought of before you know the majority of the time so there's so much power that that you can have but also businesses should be absolutely like grasping for these people because... yeah innovation comes from thinking differently and guess what totally. we think differently um yeah. so one of the like most recent um kind of um studies that was done into it was basically saying that a neurodiverse people person when they're thinking for a problem they're considering loads more data and also thinking abstract which is why often their ideas are, sound a little bit off the wall we sound a little bit but it's why we're so great at innovation because we will solve a problem in a way that no one else has ever solved it before because we think differently yeah. and we solve problems all day right you know just kind of getting through the day you know dyslexics we've got problems with sometimes speech we're calling information writing reading we've got to get a form we've got to do this we've got you know so problem solving is something that we're we're great and I think delivering solutions which so as I said neurodiverse people have a really high sense of justice that comes one from having heightened emotional senses and you know sometimes problems of emotional regulation that also comes from spending your whole life feeling having that self-belief that you're different or maybe not as good as anyone else so when we come up with those solutions you'll often find that there's solutions that are not just out of box thinking but they're about communities they're about inclusion they're about doing the right thing within that so there's also another element like they're great at people strategy for that reason because they the amount of detail and how they feel with their high levels of empathy is like how would everyone feel in this how yeah. does this problem you know and that's not to say that neurotypical people don't but just to say that that's a particular skill um, and yeah, whenever yeah. I speak to a neurodiverse person about anything they always say to me you know you talk about something and they'll go but have you considered this person how would they feel if you did that because that's just their natural how they think um yeah. so yeah definitely definitely loads of positives along with the obstacles that we face yeah. as well absolutely absolutely perfect well thank you so much I thank will... you I've really enjoyed it <laughs> me too me too that's been really really good